Good afternoon, this is Pamela, and you are listening to Watchmen on the Pod. We are going to continue today with our book reading of The Secret History of the Jesuits, written by Edmund Pierce. And we are in Section 3 with Chapter 12. Section 3 is entitled Foreign Missions. Chapter 12, India, Japan, and China. The conversion of pagans had been the first objective to the Society of Jesus' founder. Even though the necessity to combat Protestantism in Europe involved its disciples more and more, and this political as well as religious action, of which we have just gave a short summary, became their main task. They still pursued the evangelization of distant lands. Their theocratic idea, ideal, bring the world under the Holy See's authority, require that they should go into all the regions of the globe in the conquest of souls. Francis Xavier, one of Ignatius's first companions who, like him, was canonized by the church, was the great promoter of Asia's evangelization. In 1542, he disembarked at Goya and found there a bishop, a cathedral, and a convent of Franciscans who, together with some Portuguese priests, had already tried to spread around them the religion of Christ. He gave that first attempt such a strong, impetuous, impetuous, let me read that again. He gave that first attempt such a strong, impetuous, that he was surnamed the Apostle of India. Actually, he was more a pioneer and an exciter and one who really accomplished something lasting. Fiery, enthusiastic, always on the lookout for new fields of action, he showed the way more than he cleared the ground. In the kingdom of Travancore at Melka, on the islands of Banda, Massacar, and Selin, his personal charm and his eloquent speeches did wonders, and as a result, 70,000 idolaters were converted especially amongst the low case. To obtain this, he did not despise the political and even military support of the Portuguese. These results, more showy than solid, were bound to rouse interest in the missions in Europe as well as throwing a brilliant luster over the Society of Jesus. The untiring but little persevering apostle soon left India for Japan and China, where he was about to enter when he died at Canton in 1552. His successor in India, Robert de Noble, applied in that country the same methods the Jesuits used in Europe very successfully. He appealed to the higher classes, the untouchables. He gave the consecrated wafer only on the end of a stick. He adopted the, cl the clothes, habits, and way of living of the Brahmins, mixed their rites with Christian ones, all with the approval of Pope Gregory the Fifteenth. Thanks to this ambiguity, ambiguity, he converted, so he claimed, 250,000 Hindus. But about a century after his death, when the intransigent Pope Benedict XIV forbade the observance of these Hindu rites, everything collapsed and the 250 pseudo-Catholics disappeared. In the North Indian territories of the great Mughal Akbar, a tolerant man who even tried to introduce into his states a religious synchronism, the Jesuits were allowed to build an establishment at Lahore in 1575. Akbar's successors granted them the same favors. But Arug Zeb, 1666 to 1707, an Orthodox Muslim put an end to this enterprise. In 1549, Xavier embarked for Japan with two companions and a Japanese he had converted at Melka called Agaro. The beginnings were not very promising. The Japanese have their own mortality, morality and are rather reserved. Their past has set them in paganism. The adults look at those strangers with amusement and the children follow them jeering. Yagirio, native, managed to start a small community of 100 adherents. But Francis Xavier, who did not speak Japanese very well, 
could not even obtain an audience from the Milkadu. <clears throat> When he left that country, two fathers stayed behind who eventually secured the conversion of the Deimos of Arma and Bongo. When this particular one so decided in 1578, he had been considering the matter for 27 years. The following year, the fathers settled at Nakasaki. They pretended to have converted 100,000 Japanese. In 1587, the eternal situation of the land, torn apart by clan wars, changed entirely. The Jesuits had taken advantage of the anarchy and their close relations with Portuguese merchants. Hideyashi, a man of low birth, had usurped power and taken the title of Ekasama. Ekasama? He distrusted the Jesuits' political influence, their association with the Portuguese and their connection with the great and wild vassals, the samurai. In consequence, the young Japanese church was violently persecuted. Six Franciscans and three Jesuits were crucified. Many converts were murdered and murdered, and the order was banished. Nevertheless, the decree was not carried out. The Jesuits continued their apostolate in secret. But in 1614, the first shogun, Takawaki, Takawaka, Takasu, became uneasy with their occult actions, and the persecution started again. Besides, the Dutch had taken the place of the Portuguese at the businesses' counters and were closely watched by the governments. A profound distrust of all foreigners, ecclesiastics, or laymen inspired from them on the conduct of leaders, and in 1638, a, re a rebellion of the Nakasaki Christians were drowned in blood. For the Jesuits, the Japanese adventure had come to an end and was to remain so for a long time. We can read in the remarkable work of Lord Bertrand Russell, Science and Religion, the following racy passage about Francis Xavier, the miracle worker. Quote, he and his companions wrote many long letters, which were kept in them. They gave accounts of their labors. None of those written in his lifetime made any mention of the miraculous powers. Joseph Acosta, a Jesuit who was so much troubled by Peru's animals, expressly denied that this, these missionaries had been helped by miracles in their efforts to convert pagans. But soon after Xavier's death, Stories of miracles started to abound. It was said that he had the gifts of tongues, even though his letters were full of allusions to the difficulties he had to master the Japanese language or find good interpreters. Stories were told of how, when his friends had felt thirsty at sea, he would change salt water into fresh. When he dropped his crucifix into the sea, a crab brought it back to him. According to a later version, he had thrown the crucifix into the sea to still a tempest. When he was canonized in 1622, it was proved to the satisfaction of the Vatican authorities that he had accomplished miracles as no one can become as no one can come become a saint without them. The Pope gave his official guarantee to the gift of tongues and was particularly impressed by the fact that Xavier and made the lamps burn with holy water instead of oil. The same Pope, Urban VIII, refused to believe Galileo's statements. The legend continued to improve. A biography by Father Bonhars, published in 1682, tells us that the saint had resurrected, no, resuscitated, 14 persons during his lifetime. Catholic authors still attribute to him the gift of miracles. In a biography published in 1872, Father Coleridge of the Society of Jesus restated that he had the gift of tongues. Unquote. Judging by the exploits just mentioned, St. Francis Xavier well deserved his halo. In China, the sons of Loyola had a long and favorable time with only a few expulsions in between. They obtained this on condition that they would work there mainly as scientists and bow to the thousands of rites of years old rite of this ancient 
civilization. Meteorology was the main subject. Francis Xavier had already found out that the Japanese did not know the earth was round and were very interested in what he taught them on that and other similar subjects. In China, it became official, and as the Chinese were not fanatical, things developed peacefully. An Italian, Father Risi, was the initiator of it. Having made his way to Peking, he played the part of an astronomer before the Chinese scientists. Astronomy and mathematics were an important part of the Chinese institutions. These sciences enabled the sovereign to date their various seasonal religious and civil ceremonies. Risi brought information which made him indispensable and used this opportunity to speak about Christianity. He sent for two fathers who amended the tradition, the traditional calendar, establishing the accord between the course of the stars and earthy events. Risi helped with lesser tasks as well. For instance, he drew a mural map of the empire where he carefully put China at the center of the universe. This was the Jesuits' main work in that celestial empire. As for the religion side of their mission, the interest in it was minute, minute. It was, it is rather amusing to think that in Peking, the fathers were busy rectifying the astronomical mistakes of Chinese, while in Rome, the Holy See persistently condemned the Corpaconan system, and that until 1822. In spite of the fact that the Chinese had very little inclination for mysticism, the first Catholic church opened at Peking in 1599. When Risi died, he was replaced by a German, Father Shaw von Bell, an astronomer who also published some remarkable tracts in the Chinese language. In 1644, he was given the title of President of the Mathematical Tribunal which created jealousy among the mandarins. In the meantime, the Christian communities organized themselves in 1617. The emperor must have foreseen the dangers of this Pacific penetration when he decreed the banishment of all foreigners. Good fathers were sent to the Portuguese at Macchio in wooden cages. But soon after they were called back, they were such good astronomers. Oh. In fact, they were just as good as missionaries with 41 residences in China, 159 churches, and 257,000 baptized members. But a new reaction against them called for their banishment, and Father Shaw was condemned to death. No doubt he had not incurred the sentence merely for his work in mathematics. An earthquake and the burning of the imperial palace, cleverly presented as a sign of wrath from heaven, saved his life and he died peacefully two years later. But his companions had to leave China. In spite of all, the esteem for the Jesuits was so great that Emperor Kong Hai felt, felt obliged call them back in 1669 and ordered solemn funerals for the remaining of I am Lo Vim Don Van Shaw. These unusual honors were the only start of exceptional favors. A Belgium father, Verbiest, followed Shaw at the head of the missions and also the Imperial Mathematical Institute. He was the one who gave to Peking's observatory observatory, these famous instruments whose mathematical precision is concealed by the chimeras, dragons, etc. King Hai, the enlightened despot who reigned for 61 years, appreciated the services of that scientist who gave him wise advice, accompanied him to war, and even managed a foundry for cannons. But this profane and warlike activity was directed Ad majorum de glorium, as the good father reminded the emperor in a note he sent him before his death. Sir, I die happy, as I use nearly every moment of my life to serve your majesty. But I pray him very humbly to remember, after my death, that my aim 
and all I did was to procure a protector for the most holy religion in the universe, and this protector was you, the greatest king in the East. However, in China, as in Malabar, this religion could not survive without some artifice. The Jesuits had to bring the Roman doctrine to the Chinese level, identify God with heaven, Ian, or the Changtai, emperor from on high, blend Catholic rites with Chinese rites, accept Confucian teachings, the cult of the ancestors, etc. Pope Clement XI, who was told of its rival orders, condemned this doctrinal late laxism, and as a result, all the missionary work of the Jesuits in the celestial empire collapsed. The successors of Kang Hai proscribed Christianity, and the last fathers left in China died there and were not replaced. Wow. The Americas, chapter 13. The Jesuit state of Paraguay. Missionary of the G Society of Jesus found the New World much more favorable to their proselytizing than Asia. There they found no old and learned civilizations, no religions solidly established, nor any philosophical, full of philosophical traditions. But only poor and barbarian tribes, unarmed spiritually as well as temporarily for the white conquerors. Only Mexico and Peru, with the memory of Aztecs and Inca gods still fresh in their minds, resisted this imported religion for a quite a long time. Also, the Domitians and Franciscans had already established themselves solidly. It was then amongst the wild tribes, nomadic hunters and fishermen, that the sons of Loyola exercised their devouring activity. The results that obtained buried according to the fierceness and opposition of the various populations. In Canada, the Hurons, peaceful and docile, accepted easily their catechism. But their enemies, the Iroquois, attacked the stations created around Fort St. Marie and massacred the inhabitants. The Hurons were practically exterminated within ten years, and in 1649 the Jesuits had to leave with about 300 survivors. They did not make a strong impression when they went through the territories which today make up the United States. It was only during the 19th century that they started putting some roots down in that part of the continent. In South America, the Jesuits' action met with some good and bad fortunes. In 1546, the Portuguese had called them to work in the territories they possessed in Brazil. While converting the natives, they encountered many conflicts with civil liberty, civil authority and other religious orders. The same thing happened in New Granda. But Paraguay was the land for the great experience of Jesuitical colonization. This country spread then from the Atlantic to the Andes and comprised territories which today belong to Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. The only means of access through the virgin jungle was on the Paraguay and Parana rivers. The population of that land was made up of nomadic and docile Indians, ready to bow to anyone's domination as long as they were supplied with enough food and a little tobacco. The Jesuits could not find better conditions to establish a way from the corruption of whites and half-castes perfect type of colony, city of God, according to their heart's desire. At the start of the 17th century, Paraguay was made into a province by the general of the order who had been given all power by the court of Spain and the Jesuit state developed and flourished. These good savages were duly cate catechized and trained to live a sedentary life under a dis discipline as gentle as it was strong as an iron hand in a velvet glove. These patriarchal societies deliberately ignored liberties of any kind. All that a Christian possesses and uses, the hut in which he lives, the fields he cultivates, the livestock which he provides his food and clothes, the arms he carries, the tool he's worked with, even the only table knife given to every young couple when they set up a home, is Kambak, God's property. 
From the same conception, the Christian can't dispose of his time and person freely. The suckling child is under his mother's protection. As soon as he can walk, he is in the face of the or agent's power. When the child grows up, it learns, if it is a girl, to spin and weave, and if it is a boy, to read and write. But only in Qurani, where Spanish is severely prohibited, so as to prevent all trading with the corrupted Creoles. As soon as a girl is 14 and a boy 16 years of age, they are married, as the fathers are anxious not to see them fall into some carnal sin. None of them can become priest, monk, or even less Jesuit. They have particularly no liberty left, but they are obviously very happy, materially speaking. In the morning after Mass, each gang of workers go to the fields, one after another, singing and preceded by some holy image. In the evening, they come back to the village in the same manner, to hear the catechism or recite the rosary. The fathers have also thought out some honest entertainments and recreations for Christians. The Jesuits watch over them like fathers, and like fathers also, they punish the smallest mistakes. Whip, fasting, prison, pillory, and the public square, public penance in the church. These are the chastisements they use. So the red children of Paraguay know no other authority than that of the good fathers. They do not even vaguely suspect that the king of Spain is their sovereign. Is this not a picture somewhat caricatured, a perfect picture of the ideal theocratic society? Let us consider how it affected the intellectual and moral advancement of the benefactories of that system, these poor innocents, as they were called by the Mark de Loreto. The missions, high culture, is nothing more than an artificial product from a hothouse, carrying in itself a seed of death. Because, in spite of all this breaking in and training, Gurani remained deep down what he was, a lazy, savage, narrow-minded, sensual, greedy, and sordid. As the fathers themselves say, he only works when he feels the overseer's gold behind him. As soon as they are left to themselves, they are indifferent to the fact that the harvest is riding in the field. Implements are deteriorating and the herds are scattered. If he is not watched when working in the fields, he can even suddenly unyoke an ox and butcher it on the spot, light a fire with the wood of the plow, and with his companions start eating the half-cooked flesh until none is left. He knows that he will get twenty-five lashings of the whip for it, but also that the good fathers would never let him starve to death. In a book recently published, we can read the following concerning the Jesuits' punishment. Quote, the culprit, dressed in the white, dressed in the clothes of a pennant, was escorted to church where he confessed his fault. Then he was whipped on the public square according to the penal code. The culprits always received their chastisement, not only without murmurs, but also with thanksgiving. Quote. Quote again, the guilty one, having been punished and reconciled, kissed the hand of the one who struck him, saying, May God reward you for freeing me by this light punishment from the internal sorrows which threatened me. Unquote. After reading this, we can understand Mr. H. Boheimer's conclusion. Garney moral life enriched itself very little under the father's discipline. He became a devout and superstitious Catholic who sees miracles everywhere and seems to enjoy flagellating himself until blood appears. He learned to obey and was attached to the good fathers who cared so well for him with a filial attitude which, even though not very deep, was nevertheless very tenacious. This not very brilliant result proves that there was some important defect in the educative methods of the fathers. What was the defect? The fact that they never tried to develop in their red children the inventive faculties, the need for activity, the feeling of responsibility. They themselves invented games and recreations for their Christians. They thought for them instead of encouraged them to think for themselves. They merely submitted those who were under their care to a mechanical breaking in instead of actually educating them. 
How could it be otherwise when they themselves had gone through a breaking in that lasted 14 years? Were they going to teach the Garenians and their white peoples to think for themselves when they were absolutely forbidden to do so? It is not a Jesuit of old, but a contemporary Jesuit who writes, He, Jesuit, will not forget that the characteristic virtue of the company is total obedience of the action, will, and even judgment. All the spirits will be bound in the same way, the higher ones, and the Father General to the Holy Father. It was so arranged as to render the Holy See's authority universally facious, and St. Ignace was sure that teaching and education would henceforth bring back to Catholic unity a Europe torn apart. <clears throat> it was the hope of reforming the world, wrote Father Bonhars, he practically embraced this means instruction of youth. The education of Paraguay's natives was done on the same principles the father used to apply. Now apply and will apply on everyone everywhere. Your aim, deplored by Mr. Bonhar, which is ideal to the eyes of those fanatics, renouncement of all personal judgment, all initiative, blind submission to the superiors. Is it not that height of freedom, liberation from one's own bondage, praised by R. P. Requet, and which we mentioned earlier on? In fact, good Garinas had been liberated so well by the Jesuitical method for more than 150 years that their masters left during the 18th century. They went back into their forest and returned to their ancient customs as if nothing Okay, well, I'm going to end that there for today, and uh, we will resume next time in Section 4, Jesuits in the European Society. I love you all, brothers and sisters. This history is absolutely phenomenal. I am thankful to God for showing me it. I'm thankful to God for leading me to these books so I'm able to share them with you as well. Keep your eyes on Jesus, brothers and sisters. Who knows in the book, which is the Word of God. And embed the Word of God upon the tablets of your hearts so you will not sin against God. Until next time, go to the Father in prayer. As for discernment.